Pretty good, that was kind of mellow, but if you're not inspired now or after your day today, after this session, you will definitely Just be inspired. We have tonight with us Josh Pagetti, who's a, who's a PhD candidate for Penn State University. It's part of our partnership with Penn State University. I'm gonna bring up Dr. Pete Allison here in a second, who's actually uh, working with Josh in the department and um, has been very influential in what we've been working on since about 2016 towards really aligning our certifications and our credentials, aligning the skill sets of snow pros, which all of y'all encompass, and how they transfer into potentially other career pathways. Because I know we've all, uh, we've all definitely experienced times when, you know, the learning doesn't happen just on the snow, it's oftentimes the, the interactions on the chairlifts with our guests. And, uh, and some of the relationships that we form um, over the years with our guests and all of the other skill sets that we develop as snow pros, which, which really, really are important when you think about um, how they might translate into uh, whether you stay in snow sports or in other career pathways that you might encounter along the way. And Andy Dawkins said before this thing, he's like, man, you guys, we're just kind of really killing the ski bum vibe here by, by actually taking the skill sets and the street credibility of a snow crow and, and making it that much more meaningful. So it's pretty exciting. And Josh has been working on inspirational teaching, and I'm not going to steal Pete's thunder or his thunder, but really getting, digging into the characteristics of um, what inspirational teaching is all about and digging into that a little bit to see if we can learn from that and see if we can um, bring some of those pieces into our own development um, because it's all about continual learning, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna bring up Pete Allison right now who's gonna uh, introduce Josh for this segment, uh, Becoming Inspirational in Your Teaching. Here's Pete. Thanks, Dave, and welcome, everybody. Good to see everybody here tonight. Thank you. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Josh to you tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about the background of how we got here. I know some people in the room know some of this, but some of you don't. Um, and I've got the microphone, so I'm going to tell you about it again. <laughs> so about seven years ago, Dave, Nick, and I met <clears throat> at the Lakewood office. and we started talking about collaboration between PSA and Penn State. And at that time, in case you can't tell from my accent, I'm not from America. <laughs> well spotted, good observation skills. I just moved to the States and was just starting at Penn State. <clears throat> and so we started to talk about collaboration and it was pretty obvious straight away to me that this was gonna be a really great collaboration between Penn State and between uh, PSA and ASI. And, Big shout out to Nick for his vision. Nick's sitting over here, um, and he at that time had that vision and was very supportive of the partnership. So thanks, Nick. We are indebted to you for that um, that vision. So we've worked through. Um, a, I'm going to dare to mention this. We've been working for the last seven years on the alignment project, and for some people that's a swear word, um, but I think we broadly think this is a good move. This is progress. We've got new national standards, we've got the complete box set, we're very excited about those, we've got performance guides, and we've got unified assessment forms. And so we've been working on this for some time, I need to use my glasses, I'm kind of doing this glasses thing here, uh, so I can read, read my notes. <clears throat> we've worked through that, and a lot of people in this room have been involved in that, so if you've been involved in the alignment project or you've been working on a task force, I want you to give us a wave, put your hands in the air, because we've had about 200 people who've been involved in that. Give these people a round of applause. These people have been working really hard and amazing work. And they've been doing that in the evenings and weekends for the best of the good of this association. Thank you, everybody, who just put your hand up. So fairly on, early on in this whole process and the collaboration, we decided we we're gonna advertise for a PhD student because we thought, well, wouldn't this be great to have a PhD student who's working on this project and can create time and capacity 
and also a future leader for the association because we need to think about future generations coming through in the association. And so we put this advert out for, uh, would anybody be interested in that? <clears throat> and I will never forget to this day receiving this application. The application said, in the summer, I work as a lifeguard. In the winter, I work as a ski instructor. And I'm from California. Could you fit any more stereotypes? <laughs> I thought, is this gonna be, you know, is this gonna be a Baywatch star? Or what are we gonna get here? Well, <clears throat> turned out, this was a great move. Turned out, this was the application that was um, that was Josh. And so, um, <clears throat> Josh has worked really hard since he started. Um, turns out, <clears throat> he, anybody who's read one of those performance guides, anybody in the room read a performance guide? Give me a wave. Oh yes, great, well done. Okay, so those performance guides have all been formatted by Josh. He has done a ton of work on those. He's done a ton of work on the national standards behind the scenes and he has been grafting on that, at the same time as taking classes at Penn State, and at the same time as working on his thesis. So, tonight he's gonna to tell you a little bit more about that. Particularly over the last 18 months though, he has been working on um, this idea of what is inspirational snow sports education? What does that look like? Because we, through a lot of conversations, talked about how we don't just need the national team to be inspirational. We need the 36,000 members of this association to be inspirational. And so how do we do that? How do we trickle that out to get more and more inspirational people and inspire more and more, and more people into this wonderful world that we all enjoy so much? So, um, I'm delighted with the work that Josh has done and the way he's grown and where he's come to, and he's gonna tell you a bit about that tonight. What he's probably not gonna tell you is that he is also a newly minted level three. So, now, Josh Bietti, come on down. Let's give him a round of applause. See you soon. See you soon. Hi everyone. I can't beat that intro. Uh, so thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Pete. And thank you for everyone being here tonight. Uh, I'll be honest, this is not the size of the room that I expected. And this is like three times as many people as I expected in here. So for everyone here, thank you. And with that, I get to share some thoughts of inspiration, what we've learned of inspiration, in snow sports education. And uh, so as we go through this evening, we'll first think about what are some of the skills, some of the characteristics of inspirational instruction within snow sports. And then I'll be joined by Zoe Mavis and Matt Larson to dig into two skills that we can continue to work on that will help us inspire and it at least can give us an idea of what to think about as we go through the rest of the week. So as we go forward for the next bit of time, first gotta figure out why are we looking at inspiration? Why does it matter? And the reality of what we do as snow sport instructors is we get to interact with a majority of the skiers and riders on the mountain. Whether they are our students or whether they ask us a quick question, we are front facing, we are in the public's eye, either talking to them, skiing under them on the snow as they go up on the chairlift. So we give them an idea of what good, enjoyable snow sports is. And with that, we are super influential in this industry. And as we think about why we're here in this room, we're trying to learn from some of the most influential snow sports instructors. And why are we trying to learn that? We're trying to learn that because we want to bring it to our own mountains. So the purpose of this research is try to help you bring this to your day-to-day -day instruction. 
And what's great is we as snow sports instructors, we're ambassadors for the sports, for our community, both the small communities of our mountains, but the larger community of American snow sports. And I'm going to throw up a paragraph. Don't feel like you need to read it. But what I love about this paragraph is that this paragraph is from our teaching snow sports manual. It's our very last paragraph in our snow sports manual. And it tells us that we have the opportunity not just to educate, but the opportunity to inspire recreational and competitive skiers and snowboarders and welcome newcomers to the sports. But in order to do so, we as skiers and riders, we as instructors need to continue to learn. As we continue to learn, this gives us the knowledge that we can pull from, and it gives us the ability to make decisions on the go quickly based on conditions, based on the environment, and most importantly, based on our students. So as we go through that, let's now think about what inspiration is. And before I share what some of your peers have told me about inspiration, some of the national team have told me about inspiration, I want to give everyone a moment to connect with your table and share a word, phrase, thought that you associate with inspiration. All right, I'll give you a moment. All right, so as I hope that as a table, you could talk about inspiration for quite some time, I just wanted to get you to start thinking about what words come to your mind. And then as I start to throw up some descriptions of inspiration, try to think about how any of these words resonate with your idea of inspiration. Because even though inspiration may be individual, what I do with one person on the snow may not work for the next. The idea of inspiration seems to be pretty consistent across snow sports instructors. So with that, when we start as snow sports instructors, when we inspire, we're evoking something. We're evoking or we're starting a spark, okay? We're igniting passion for whatever that is. And we end up, I'm using we as we are all going to inspire, we end up being a catalyst for motivation to take an action. So as we think about that, this is just the first step of inspiration. If we don't follow through, if we don't allow for a cause and effect, or if we don't allow for the inspiration to lead to a call to action, Inspiration's incomplete. But what is the cause? What is the change that is coming because of inspiration? What is the action we're going to take? This is the most important part of inspiration. This is the action. This is the final piece that we're really trying to get. If we inspire, the hope is that someone wants to emulate what we are doing. They want to replicate our actions. They want to do what we do they want to be like their inspiration. So it's about emulating. Even more so, not just about the connection with the inspiration, but thinking about oneself. They want to do more, learn more, and be more. And oftentimes with inspiration, not all the time, but many times, inspiration leads to a greater willingness of trying something new. 
So if it's trying a new sport, if it's trying a new run, a new trick, going for longer in cross-country skiing, whatever it may be, inspiration has a role in that. And lastly, inspiration has this opportunity to show someone a new possibility, and it'll encourage that person to reach a new potential. So as we bring all of this together, we'll think of inspiration as someone or something that triggers us to strive for and achieve a new potential. So as we think about the skills that we're gonna go over, we're trying to help our students achieve a new potential. Okay, when I say go, with your neighbor. Has anyone ever played Mad Libs? Okay, that's where I got this idea from. So we're gonna do Mad Libs, but please give a real inspiration and a real action. Share with your neighbor who or what has inspired you and what did they inspire you to do? Just a quick minute. And after you share, just throw your eye gaze up here so that I know when you're done. No rush. So as you're finishing up this statement, hold on to that statement and think about why or how they've inspired you. And just think about what that something or that someone has done and why inside you it inspired you to do whatever action you put in here. So even as I had interviews with individuals, some in this room, many in this room, it was pretty easy to answer, or ask this first question. Who has inspired you? What has inspired you? But as soon as we got into the why and how, it took a little bit more thought process to get there. And then it took an even more thought process to think about, especially for the instructor who's inspiring, how did they develop those skills? So that, has led me to this research. And I'm really excited, especially when Matt and Zoe come up, to think about how we can improve some of our skills to enhance our opportunity to inspire. So with that, I would like to think we all want to be in this category as snow sports instructors. We want to be those who our students say we are inspired by us, okay? And what are they inspired to do? Right? Everyone wants to ski, to ride, to be on the mountain, to learn and develop. But what I started to notice in the interviews is that there's a little bit more to inspiration. It's this idea of creating a lifelong passion. Right? And we create that lifelong passion. We create adventure. And that's all coming through the education that we do. And as we create this lifelong passion, we're helping our students achieve this sense of autonomy. Okay, they're learning from us, but they can go on the mountain and they can go ski on their own with their friends, with their family. They have this greater sense of competence. 
when they're skiing, they feel like they're doing it well. When they're riding, they think they look great. And then, when it comes to a sense of belonging, it's not just the individual, I can do this on my own, or I can do this well. It's also this sense of, I belong in a part of a community. Maybe some of those join us instructor, as instructors. Maybe some go race. Maybe some are just lifelong recreational skiers. And that's everything that we want to do as instructors. So if we go back to the Mad Lib, and if we give this to our students, I sure hope that they say, I was inspired by my instructor. What they say after totally depends on their goals. Do they want to be a skier? Were they inspired to be a snowboarder? Were they inspired to keep, to keep learning and come back? And were they inspired to join the community of snow sports or join the community of being in a healthy outdoor lifestyle group of people? So with that, the question that we're going to go deeper into is how do snow sports instructors inspire, right? If we know we want to be the ones to inspire, let's figure out how we can do it. And as we think about that, before I go into just saying, hey, these are the nine skills, I want to first quickly share, this is where the information is coming from. Because this is also super important, knowing that it first came from last year, right here at National Academy, I got to participate in and observe 10 clinics facilitated by different PSIA ASI national team members. So I was with Alpine, I was with Snowboard, Adaptive, and Telemark. I'm sorry, Cross Country, I would love to do this just with Cross Country next. Uh, but as we do so, or as we did so, I was able to observe and focus on how they facilitate the learning experience and how these team members are interacting with the group and with individuals, not just on the snow, but for the entire week. And then afterwards, I got to connect with a handful of participants. Some of you are in this room, and thank you for being a part of this research. And they got to share their experiences with inspirational instructors. They got to share with me what it was that the instructors do, or the instructors have done, to inspire them to continue to learn. After these two steps, I went back to the national team members that I observed, and I got to learn from them the skills, the strategies, the behaviors that they regularly apply in their teaching to inspire their students. Think about what they do, how they do it, and how did they develop those skills. So now we can go into what those skills are. But as we do so, this looks pretty familiar. Okay, we train to this. We use this on a daily basis. And what I find super exciting is that inspirational instruction lies within the learning connection model and lies within the fundamentals that we use when we instruct. So starting with people skills, genuine engagement and connection is the first step in inspiring. Then, when an instructor is purposeful and deliberate in their teaching, this has a greater chance of inspiring the student to continue to ski, ride, or learn more. And of course, technical mastery. And this is not just technical mastery in terms of performance, this is technical mastery in terms of knowledge. And we'll get into that a little bit more. So, these are the three main categories. Genuine engagement and connection, purposeful teaching, technical mastery. Let's jump into each one of these on their own. So first, as we think about genuine engagement and connection, the first step in promoting an inspirational learning experience is engaging through recognition. So when we meet our students, we often learn about who they are what their goals are, what their needs are, their interests, their previous experiences, and then we find their baseline knowledge and skills. 
the inspirational instructors, they hold on to all that knowledge and they continue to tie back or go back to that for the instruction, for the entire clinic and engage the student recognizing what the student is capable of and building upon that. And then with that, it's connecting at an empathetic level. This is creating relationships both on the snow, in the lesson, and beyond the snow. When I was here at National Academy, Rider Alley last year, the number of conversations that I got to be a part of and hear off the snow was incredible. And then to hear these national team members continue those conversations, ask about what the students are trying to achieve short term and long term. When we think of sympathy and empathy, there's the analogy of someone being in a hole. Is anyone familiar with that analogy? I see some head nods, and I see otherwise not much. So <laughs> let's think about, and that's perfect. I'd rather talk about it than just assume everyone knows. But imagine someone's down here in a hole. And the short version of sympathy is, I'm sorry you're down there. Empathy. I see someone in a hole. I'm going to jump in. First, I'm going to recognize where the student is. Hey, what's going on? Why are you here? And where do you want to go? Well, I'm here because of X and I sure as heck want to get out of here. Okay, hey, believe it or not, I've been, ha I've been down here before. And I have some tools. I have some skills that I can share with you that I can teach you to help you get out of that. So that right there, that came up in one of the interviews. And it was fantastic to hear that over and over, when an instructor joins the student in the learning process, there's much more reception to the learning and both get to continue to learn. And then as we think about the blue circle in our learning connection model, we get to think about being humble and being human. And these two words were common words put together by both participants and national team members to describe kind of the demeanor and the general decisions, general behaviors of an inspirational instructor. So in terms of humility, it is working with the students, going to their level, and maintaining that connection peer to peer, even though there may be a student instructor separation or student instructor hierarchy, it is still more peer to peer. And when it comes to being human, I found this pretty interesting in that when I asked what does being human actually mean, it means to admitting to mistakes or saying, oh, actually, let's do this because what I had in mind wasn't actually what is happening or the intended goal didn't happen. And then it's talking about success stories. It's talking about trial and tribulations, both past and present. Because for a student to understand what's going on with their inspirational instructor, that student wants to know that the instructor is also continuing to learn. That instructor wants to grow, and that, to the people that I interviewed, that is considered being human. And then, oh, and then we get into purposeful teaching. And as we think about purposeful teaching, purposeful teaching, just like our teaching learning cycle, it is a sequential process. And what we saw and what I learned about in the interviews and observations is that inspirational teaching relies heavily on experimentation, exploration, and play. When it comes to experimentation, that is trying to figure out what moves work and why. What is the cause and effect of something that we do with our body, both positive and negative and anything in between. Exploration is then using those refined skills and bringing it across the mountain, bringing it into different turn sizes, different turn styles, different terrain, and allowing for the student to figure out when it's applicable, when it's fun, when it's a lot of work. And then play, play is important. Last year we did have some great snow and there were opportunities where we couldn't let learning get in the way of fun. And there were some great turns at the top of the tram in this research. 
So with that, when we set it up with experimentation, exploration, and play, inspirational instructors are able to stimulate a new potential through feedback and purposeful question asking. So we'll talk a little bit more about feedback when we have Matt and Zoe here, but feedback is a very important piece. In order for learning to occur, feedback must happen. And that feedback doesn't have to be verbal. It doesn't have to necessarily come from the instructor. It could be a cue. It could be the mountain speaking to us through our equipment. But as long as the instructor guides the student to understand and interpret what that feedback means, then the student can gain a greater sense of ownership and self-confidence in their scheme. So this is moving someone towards both autonomy and a sense of competence. We want to ensure that with the feedback we provide, the student is able to continue to work on it without repeated feedback. And then they can go on their own and say, oh, that felt right when I did this in my turn. Something responded with the snow. They felt something in their boots. Whatever it may be, based on the connection that you make and the feedback that you give. And then we get into technical mastery. And I don't think it's surprising to anyone that outstanding performance is a critical part, critical piece to inspirational teaching. And that is not just outstanding performance down the big C, in the steeps, in the bumps. This is also outstanding performance in our basic wedge turns, in our wedge Christie's. If we have clean demos, if we can demonstrate what is ideal and we can demonstrate or perform at such an elite level in all terrain across the mountain, we are showing our students a short-term potential. So what are we asking our students to do today or this week? And then showing them potential of what is possible if they continue working towards their next goal or their next goals. And then with that, inspirational instructors create a potential for improvement. And what this is referring to is thinking about having precise movement analysis and having a quick, simple decision-making process to bring upon change, positive change in someone's scheme. And this takes experience. This does take a trained eye. In other sports, they call this the expert eye. And you need to spend time with it, and that's OK. But as you do so, you're also building that knowledge base. And as you grow that wealth of knowledge, this third piece of technical mastery is super important. Distilling knowledge is critical to inspire. If I throw out all my research, I might lose you at some point. If I can distill it down to these nine points, I'm hoping that you can grasp onto one, two, three, or all nine. And with distilling knowledge, there's a couple ways that that was occurring. Using analogies to bring some familiarity to a new movement, a new position, or a new concept on your equipment. It is also thinking of creating cues or keywords between instructor and student so that when you are communicating, you have a shared understanding of what you're talking about. And that shared understanding comes from relating this knowledge back to the student's background, the student's interests, and the student's goals. So with that, we have our nine skills within the three main areas of inspirational teaching. And for the next bit of time, we're gonna hang out with Matt and Zoe, thinking about how we can become more authentic, how we can practice humility, practice being a human in our instruction, and then we're gonna think about how we can improve our feedback delivery and how that can help us inspire our students. So with that, we're gonna get set up real quick, but we have Matt Larson and Zoe Mavis joining us on stage. Yeah. That's just for you. We're gonna sit? Yeah. Okay, okay, cool.
Do I, I need this mic, right? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Larson. Uh, I'll just say, Josh, thank you for including me, Zoe, everyone else on this project. I went into it thinking, oh, he's going to ask me some questions on being inspirational, and I think I should know how to do this. And, and then I'd be like, yeah, you just be genuine. And then he would say, uh, okay, well, how do you be genuine? And then eventually authenticity came up. And, all right, well, explain authenticity to me. And, and all of a sudden I'm feeling like, okay, it's like a therapy session here. I, <laughs> <laughs> this is getting hard. Uh, short story, I've learned a lot by being a part of this. And I have some comments to share with you this evening about what this authenticity thing is or what it means to be authentic when you're interacting with people around you. And the one thing is being vulnerable. And of course, when I said that to Josh, he's like, all right, well, what do you mean being vulnerable? So I had to come up with some more comments for him. And, and I think one that we can relate to is having some skin in the game. And when I got there, I was like, oh, okay, I, I think I can come up with some examples of having some skin in the game. And it's, uh, it gets us into the how piece, which is, which is the takeaway for all of us. Gratitude is having some skin in the game, saying thank you and acknowledging the, the participation that's happening within your group. I think that's a, a key component. And when I said that and Josh seemed pleased by my answer, I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> now we're winning. And another key component is and a skill, that was the one other thing you kept asking me. It's like, okay, we need skills, Matt. Active listening. And, and I, I paused after say it, saying it at first because I think it's a, it's a great skill and it's something I think is common that we talk about in trainings all the time. Be an active listener. It falls into our people skills. Uh, effective two-way communication. It's even one of our fundamentals in there. And, and I think it's important to take it to one more level of understanding that the people that you're interacting with, their perception of what you think is being authentic actually is, is seen in that light. And, and that's, I think, a real trick to that. And, and I also think it's, it can be really simple by just smiling and taking an extra second to make eye contact with people. That it's a way to show nonverbal communication, to connect with people. And, and I think it has a high probability that when you're ha having that interaction with people, they're gonna feel like you're, you got some skin in the game and that you're being authentic with them. Those were my big takeaways. Awesome. Matt, thank you for sharing. And so as Matt's talking about authenticity, and if we go back, I'm not going to flip through all the slides, but if we go back to genuine engagement and connection, having an authentic relationship, an authentic connection with the students helps us build trust. Right? That's top of our people skills. And as we work towards that, as we use conversation, as we use active listening, that skill gives us the information, gives us the data that we need to make decisions for purposeful teaching and for distilling knowledge in particular. Whatever we learn from our students, whatever we gain by listening to them closely, we can then use to make our decisions later on down the line. So with that, we'll have opportunity for questions on authenticity in a little bit. We're gonna jump into Feedback delivery with Zoe. I'm gonna stand up because I'm not great at talking when I'm sitting down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, who here has gotten a piece of feedback that didn't quite hit? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there could have been maybe you didn't understand it. Maybe the time and place when it was given did not feel great. Um, and maybe the way it was delivered wasn't helpful. Yes, maybe one of those things. Yeah, or all of them? Great. Um, as, uh, as Josh said, 
if we want to be inspirational teachers, right, part of learning requires feedback, right? We need to be able to understand what is happening and how to make that change. Our job as instructors is to be able to provide an environment in which that feedback happens in a way that creates change. Sometimes that feedback is going to be verbal. We're going to give that. As Josh said, sometimes the mountain gives us feedback. Who got feedback from the mountain today? I did. Absolutely, right? Did it make us change something? Maybe, or maybe a few people found themselves much closer to the mountain, maybe not on their feet anymore, yeah? If we think back to that learning connection model, um, and we think about those skills that Josh put up, right? We remember what they are, they're technical teaching people skills, right? We get to decide how we use those skills, and especially in feedback with our students. If we are more skilled at seeing what's happening in real time on the hill and understanding some cause and effect relationships, feedback is probably going to be more accurate, right? A little bit more clear, a little bit more relevant. If we know how to describe that change, relate that change, maybe give some better demonstrations and descriptions, we're going to be able to connect that student to the learning environment. If we know how to deliver that feedback so it's going to be heard at the appropriate time in the appropriate way, we're going to build a better relationship based on trust so that student wants to then hear further feedback and they do want to try what we're asking them. No matter how we choose to give feedback on the Hill, if we have more skills in all three of those zones, we're going to have more tools to be able to make that decision and create more relevance for our students, which hopefully then results in some inspiration. Those are my thoughts. Thank you, Zoe. Mm -hmm. So as you two have shared, just with these two bits, authenticity and with feedback delivery, we can actually begin to hit all three major areas of inspirational instruction and continue to hit everything in the learning connection model. So if it is beginning and continuing to be authentic with your students, being an active listener, gaining that knowledge from them so that when it comes to teaching them, you understand when they want their feedback, how they want their feedback, and what kind of feedback they want. So that's the connection between these two. Now, I do have questions for you two, Matt and Zoe. You're so I'll bring them. I'm on a move. <laughs> and as we think about, okay, here's how we can do it. We can be better with our feedback. How? And how can we work on our active listening skills? So, Zoe, can we start with what's an activity or what's something that we can do to improve our feedback delivery? Ooh. Okay, so something we can do to improve our feedback. First and foremost, I think, um, who here has a, a little bit of a challenge sometimes that a student skis for them or snowboards for them, and they're like, uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what I want to do with them. I felt that. Yeah. Uh, give yourself more time. First and foremost, I think we are too quick to want to give the student information. If you need to take time, to gather all of the information so you can then present them with something that will be relatable and will help them create change, give yourself time. I know it's not a drill, but it's a, it's a tip. <laughs> Do not feel like you need to share things immediately to provide value. The value comes with the relevance and if change happens. So for my first tip would be give yourself more time to think within yourself, use all of your skills, gather the information you need so that when you present the information to your student, it's relevant and clear. Perfect, thank you. And so with Sorry, that, when you think up. about giving time, that's not just a pause in the lesson. That could be another run. That could be another half of run. And more often than not, our students want to slide down the hill. They want to ski and ride when they're with us. So I don't think they would have a problem with skiing or riding a little bit more. 
And so, with active listening, what do you have for us? What can we do to enhance our active listening in our lesson? Thank you, God, for that question. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Great example. I want to try to active listening back. Thank you, Matt. So as we've gone through these nine areas within the three main skill sets, what I'm excited about is this is just the introduction to improving our instruction so that we can inspire. As I conclude this research, I'm excited to keep working with PSI ASI to bring some materials out and bring forth some activities, bring forth some training that we can do individually with our schools, perhaps here at Academy, so that we can go back on the snow and bring that same level of care, authenticity, bring back the information they want so that they keep coming back, they being the students. So soon I'm going to open it up to a Q&A. But if you have not already, there is an article that was published in March. Uh, myself, Zoe, Matt, Mike Hafer are all a part of this uh, that Peter Cray wrote. And it's just an introduction to this concept of inspirational teaching. As we move forward, more of these articles are going to come out, either as shorts or as pieces like this, to provide tidbits into this research and how we can apply it into our own practice as instructors. So before we get into Q&A, I just want to say a big thank you to PSI, AASI, for having me here, not just tonight, but throughout my entire graduate school experience, mm -hmm. through my master's, as I complete my PhD, and doing my research here with you all. So for the team members that participated, thank you for inviting me and welcoming me into the groups last year. For the participants that are in this room, again, I look forward to connecting with you and hearing your thoughts about what you have gained after you have contributed to all this research. And then I also want to thank the dissertation committee, Pete Allison, a few other professors from Penn State, and Dave Schuling, uh, acting as an outside, board, or outside member to make sure that what I'm finding is relevant to you all. The importance of this research to me is to enhance what we do as instructors. So as we go into the week, please find me if you have questions, thoughts on inspiration, anecdotes of it. I would love to hear that. And I encourage you to bring these conversations into your groups. So there are 13 
national team members that went through these interviews. There are 14 participants that went through these interviews and they can share their experiences. But I want everyone to feel comfortable sharing these experiences with one another, because that's how we grow as instructors, is sharing what we do. And with that, if you have questions for me, for Zoe, or for Matt, I'd like to open up the floor. Nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Answer that? Yes. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm going to do my very best. <laughs> Thank you for that question. And I think every question after this is going to be easy. So, <laughs> the great thing about doing research in snow sports education in the United States is that there isn't really any. So, I had an open field to look at being snow sports. However, we have literature on inspiration from psychology. We have literature on inspiration in general education and other recreational fields. But as we think about what we want to do in snow sports, we want to promote the longevity of our industry. We want to keep people in it. So as we think about inspiration as this term, as this psychological concept of hooking someone into it, I would like to think that's what I'm contributing to not just snow sports, but recreation education in general. Second question. <laughs> so, the, so the interviews that the, the data you collected uh, were from adults, I assume. Uh, how do you think that will extend to uh, when the uh, extend to the audience when audiences change? Okay, another fantastic question. Does anyone want to do that for their PhD? <laughs> okay, volunteer. Uh, as I got to speak with both participants and with national team members, they reflected on their childhood. There were influential people in their childhood, whether it was parents, their instructors, coaches, or their peers that helped them. So I'd like to think that one of the strengths of working with adults was to have that reflective piece thinking about, okay, what was that initial hook? What was that initial inspiration that has got them to where they are? And then what has been the continued inspiration as adults? And I also recognize that I was interviewing all instructors. So we know what we do. We know what we're capable of. So there very well may be some different answers if we went to the general public. And I don't have those answers yet. All right. Yes. Okay. Good warm up for your defense, huh, Jeff? Yeah, I was not expecting this. Good. That's good. There you go. See if I can answer the first one first. I, I actually have an answer for the second one, which I'm excited to share. Uh, so, inspired to study inspiration. Uh, so when I decided to go into grad school, I came here. 
and I got to ski with Jeb. I got to ski with a handful of team members. And I already had an idea that I wanted to be in this industry for the long run. Hence why I'm doing my PhD in snow sports education. Uh, but to get here before actually applying to grad school, I, I still don't know. Um, the, I don't know the exact moment, but really what it comes down to has been my experiences at Mammoth where I instruct and growing as an instructor. Um, thinking about what it took to get me there in the first place, how much I learned, especially in my first two seasons, going through level ones, um, and then understanding some of the impacts that I had on my students. And I do work primarily in the adaptive realm, so with that I had a lot of returning students and to see their progress and their desire to come back was critical for me to see, okay, there is potential of retaining people in here. So in that sense, it, it was kind of that longitudinal growth as an instructor myself. It was like, okay, how do we inspire others to continue on this path? Second question, how can we measure inspiration? There are a few instruments out there to measure inspirational state uh, and whatnot, but as we think about the nine areas that we just went over, one opportunity could be is we have individuals go out, students go learn, and they, on a scale of one to seven, say, on a scale of one to seven, how is their engagement through recognition or description of that? And if we start to, and then the final question is, were you inspired to come back on a scale of one to seven and see if there's any correlation with a set of those? That is one area I see as an opportunity to measure inspiration. Thank you for those questions. Thank you. Would Matt and Zoe be willing to answer what inspired them? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> inspired us to do what? <laughs> what inspired us to become snow sports instructors? Want to go first? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, well, reflecting on my childhood, um, obviously it was a love for the sports. I think we all can kind of agree with that, that we love the sport. And um, I was fortunate enough to have some great coaches and instructors along the way. Um, I think the, the moment that I decided I wanted to be in the industry, I was in college and I needed a ski pass. And so working at the local mountain made sense because I did that a little bit in high school. And um, I just quickly learned that my love of the sport had evolved to loving sharing it with others. And so I think that was like, when I got that job then, I had taught skiing a little bit in high school, but when I got the job then, um, I quickly learned that I liked it more for how I got to share than just the skiing aspect. We could call my parents, maybe. <laughs> provide that history. I, I pretty much fell into it, similar to Zoe. I, I was in high school, and I wanted a way to get to the hill, and I was broke, so uh, I needed a job, and if I could do that while sliding in snow, that's how I got there. Highland Hills, and there's some Minnesota representatives in here. Yes, that's where I started in 98. And, uh, and so the, the, the love and inspiration to continue really was born after I got the job. And it also, I'm excited to share this too because it really bled through my entire life. It, I became an educator in all kinds of ways. Uh, I'm a nurse and there's a big education component in that. Uh, I got to do ropes course instruction through the YMCA and interact with people when they're really vulnerable and learning about how to say thank you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how simple that could be. Just, just say thank you. Uh, or ask for help was another big thing to help people explore the importance of. And, and as I was having all these experiences, that really fueled my continued participation and involvement with PSAA. So, yeah, thank you.
very thoughtful comments on, on separating between the integration aspect versus the motivation aspect. I'm just curious. Yeah, absolutely. And I had this very conversation with Pete before I got onto this topic. Why not motivation? Why inspiration? And Zoe actually said it when I got to chat with her, but inspiration is a catalyst. It gets us into what we want to do or what we may want to do, and then there are different motivations to keep us there. As we just heard, there are motivations as a young adult to be an instructor, but then they had inspiration once they got in to continue their growth and their development. So inspiration doesn't necessarily just have to be before a motivation. It can be a bit of a leapfrog or a cycle of, I was inspired to start, now I'm motivated to stay. And then I was inspired to do something new, go for my level two, go for my level three. And now I'm motivated to train. So there is this relationship between the two. Um, and there is some work out there in the psych psychology realm realm that looks at the differences between the two. Thank you. I, thank you for that. I'm gonna take a stab at it. I, I think that this idea of being inspirational uh, can feel like a heavy load, especially if we have such a small window of time to create that for somebody. And so uh, my approach, I guess, to try to answer your question is to rely on my ability, and hopefully this is an ability that Josh can verify, to connect with people and be authentic and genuine with them. And that by doing that and shining the spotlight on those, those students that I have, those guests that I'm interacting with, and, and relating to them and finding some moment, maybe it's just one turn or maybe it's just something that we said to encourage them that that might be that inspiration though i might not see it looking back i might not see an indication from that person that they were inspired in that moment that i'm i'm just going to really just trust in how i present myself that it's providing an opportunity that it could happen that we could have this catalyst I'm gonna give an answer too. <laughs> um, because I think it's valid, and I think there's a lot of schools out there that do have that like two hour lesson and um, beginner lesson, and it's a short amount of time. Um, and I'm gonna give an answer that I believe is true. It might not be the answer that you wanna hear. Um, I believe it's based on skill. I think the more you develop your skills in all three of those triangles, in your technical and your teaching and your people skills, the easier it is to utilize those skills in a quicker way to create relevance for your students, which then I think can create some inspiration. So I would, you know, do, doing some more training, some more focusing can be, I think can be helpful for some of those instructors who are having a, a hard time creating that spark in a short amount of time. That's great. You must be in management. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the training manager, can you tell? <laughs> This has been really fun this season to think about how my research has influenced how I instruct. And I mean, to be quite frank, when I started the season, after interviewing 27 individuals who have experienced inspiration or have inspired, 
all of a sudden I couldn't remember what were my skills that I knew to do, knew how to do, and what skills I was trying to replicate from those who were saying this is how you do it. Um, but as I went through the season, I found what was authentic for me. And a lot of that came down to teaching a little bit more slowly and having a bit of bit more collaboration with the students. So thinking in terms of the fundamentals, um, actually collaborating with the students continuously and understanding what they actually want. And sometimes learning through the whole day is not the purpose. Um, there is a bit of that experience, the social side, um, and at a destination resort, there is something about learning about the place. Why is the place special to me? How can I share that with others? Uh, so that was something big that came out of this transition out of the summer research into my season and thinking about how I can improve my own instruction. But it's going to continue, certainly. I love that question, because it's hitting two big pieces. It's trying to figure out how do we enhance our new instructors, and how do we enhance our potentially new skiers and riders, mm -hmm. or long-term skiers and riders. So thank you for bringing this up. And as we talk about inspiration, yes, we all, we, I hope we all strive to be inspirational instructors, but as we break it down, we can think about one skill at a time. Just as if we were to teach with the learning connection model, hey, today we're gonna focus on our tech skills. We're gonna work on our demos. Maybe we're gonna go work on how do we deliver feedback or when do we deliver feedback and think about what cues are coming our way and thinking about how can we bring that in a more simple form to those new hires, to those that are going for their level one and maybe not put the pressure of, hey, you're learning this to inspire. It's you're learning this to be a better instructor and if it just so happens that you inspire along the way, that's the bonus. Then, as Zoe says, with experience, we gain that ability to make decisions on the go, and we're more likely to inspire as we continue to grow as an instructor. Oh, I think we have another response too. Yeah, I want, I'd love to add something to that. And uh, I'm gonna shine a spotlight on a model that I think needs more attention. It's called the SCARF model and it's in our materials. And what it stands for is uh, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And those are components that really lay for a foundation where someone's gonna be more likely to engage with you versus go on defense and uh, check out potentially. And I think that's another really cool training opportunity, especially for our new instructors, is to identify those components and offer ways, even just scripting, on how you might ask a question or pinpoint providing autonomy to your students or fairness or, or all of those components within the SCARF model. So I'll, I'll throw that one out there for you. You're welcome. Thanks, Matt. Yes, Ron. I, I already have the mic. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> so this falls nicely into what Matt just said. The even as we conduct the jam, one of the things we find is that the candidates look so hard for what people do are doing wrong, mm. and and they they pause and they hesitate and go, well, I'm having trouble finding out what this person person's doing wrong. And Joe and I shared that we're like, well, start telling us about what they're doing. Start talking about what they're doing right. From the research on um, inspiration, what's the balance do you think of affirmation versus correction? Like, how much time do you spend to inspire people by, by seeing them and seeing what they're doing right? Yeah, I 
love that question because there's two particular interviews that stand out in my mind in response to that. One is sometimes, oftentimes, the skiers and riders that come take a lesson may not be as technically sound as we are. And that's okay, because then we ask them, what is their goal? And if their goal is to ski certain terrain or do some trick, then we work with what they have. We try to understand what their baseline is and build from that. Rather than saying what's wrong, hey, can we adjust, can we replace? It's not about fixing someone, but it's enhancing someone. That, so that came out of one interview, and they really talked about how this is not about, as you're saying, the negatives. This is about building upon the positives in someone's skiing or their writing. Uh, the other one that, that stood out is very similar idea. Uh, and it's this idea that people are coming with different goals in mind, right? And it's not our purpose to convince them that the way that we do it is the right way, but the way that we do it may make it more efficient, may make it more fun, and build from there. So trying to find that happy medium of, yes, we're doing our technical MA and saying, ah, oh, okay, there's something that's maybe not right, but there are some things that are right, and how do we find where they want to be or where they can be for the short term and the long term? Time to the rest of the committee is nearby. That'd be really nice, yeah. <laughs> we are recording it though, a lot of people. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I'm going to hand the mic back over to Pete. Thanks, Daddy. Um, I want to help everybody in the room with the self awareness, whether you want to hear it or not. <laughs> you are quite possibly the most intimidating group of people that Josh could have stood up in front of. <laughs> Regarding electives, at the beginning I mentioned the cross-country elective opportunities. I'm also